He called himself the bad conscience of the Nazis. War criminals feared the day he'd knock on their door. And he dedicated his life to seeking justice for six million souls. His name was Simon Wiesenthal, but the world knew him as the Nazi hunter. Admirers praised him for shaping the public's understanding of the Holocaust. But critics accused him of shameless self-promotion, wild exaggeration, and even outright fraud. So what's the real story behind the man who hunted down more than a thousand Nazis? Simon Wiesenthal was born in a dying empire in 1908. He lost his father to World War I, his only brother to a freak accident. He was denied entry to his first choice school because of strict Jewish quotas. And when he finally opened his own architecture firm with his wife, Stalin's army marched in and forced him to close down his business. The Soviet occupation was bad enough, but it was a cakewalk compared to what happened next. Because in June of 1941, the Nazis set up shop in Wiesenthal City, Lviv. Within a matter of weeks, they'd murdered 6,000 Jews. Wiesenthal would have been one of them if not for his would-be execution or snap decision to put down his gun and attend evening mass. In late 1941, he and his wife were deported to a concentration camp where he cheated death once again. In honor of Hitler's 54th birthday, the camp's second lieutenant decided to shoot 54 Jews. Wiesenthal was meant to be one of them. He watched as his fellow inmates were shot in front of him, knowing he would be next. But the camp's senior inspector arrived just in time, pulling Wiesenthal out of line so he could design a birthday sign for Hitler. More near misses followed. He escaped from the work camp right before it was liquidated and went into hiding with the help of the Polish resistance. He was discovered and sent right back to the ruins of the camp where he decided to commit suicide, terrified the Gestapo would discover his link to the underground. But his multiple suicide attempts failed and the Nazis had more pressing matters to deal with, like the advance of Allied forces. They sent their prisoners west to a series of forced labor camps. Conditions were brutal, but once again, Wiesenthal cheated death even when the camp doctor amputated his injured toe with household scissors and no anesthetic. By the time the American troops liberated Mauthausen, Wiesenthal weighed a paltry 96 pounds. Though the World War was ending, Wiesenthal's personal war was just beginning. He was haunted by a memory that would shape his life's mission. Early in the war, Nazi officers had forced him and his fellow inmates to dig a mass grave for a group of female prisoners. As he dug, he caught a young girl's desperate eye. Don't forget us is what that look said to me. Wiesenthal later recounted. That plea became the driving force of his life. He did not forget, and he made sure that the world would not forget either. Mere weeks after liberation, Wiesenthal assembled an eight-page list of Nazi war criminals, which he delivered to the US Army's war crimes office. For two years, he worked with the army as an interpreter, while also heading a relief and welfare organization to support survivors. Later, he opened the Jewish Historical Documentation Center in a tiny crowded office in Linz, Austria, mere miles from Mauthausen, from which he had been liberated only a few years before. Along with a team of 30 volunteers, he gathered evidence about Nazi war crimes, determined to show the world that spilling Jewish blood came with a heavy price. As the Cold War ramped up, America and the Soviet Union turned their attention away from Nazi hunting. Slowly, Wiesenthal's volunteers began moving on and rebuilding their lives in the US or Israel. But Wiesenthal was relentless, even when he was forced to close down the center in 1954. By then he had a network of 100,000 survivors across Europe who helped him distribute photographs of former SS officers, many of whom were living under false identities. But Wiesenthal was obsessed with one Nazi in particular. Eichmann is wesentlich mitverantwortlich für die sogenannte Entlösung der jüdischen Frage. Adolf Eichmann had personally organized and managed the mass deportation of millions of Jews to ghettos and death camps including 89 of Wiesenthal's own family members. A public trial wouldn't bring back any of the Jews he'd murdered, but it would nudge the scales ever so slightly towards justice. Night after night, the Nazi hunter lay awake, unable to relax, imagining the moment he'd finally nab Eichmann. His doctor told him to find a hobby, preferably one that didn't involve Nazis. So he did what any Nazi hunter does with his free time. He collected stamps, even forming friendships with fellow collectors, including a wealthy baron who hated the Nazis just as much as Wiesenthal. He showed Wiesenthal a letter from a friend in Argentina who claimed to have spotted Eichmann in Buenos Aires. But when Wiesenthal shared this tip with the World Jewish Congress, they turned him away. They simply didn't have the money or resources to trek all over Argentina on the basis of one tip. So Wiesenthal shared this tip, as well as photographs he'd snapped of Eichmann's family, with the Israeli Mossad. When the Mossad captured Eichmann in Argentina a few years later, 
Wiesenthal was elated. His book, I Chased Eichmann, was released a few weeks before Eichmann's trial. It was a major win, and it made Wiesenthal a celebrity. Still, he wasn't satisfied. He had an endless list of Nazis who he needed to bring to justice. Encouraged by the Eichmann success, he reopened the Jewish Documentation Center in Vienna and focused on his next hunt. Who would be next? By the 1960s, Holocaust deniers began questioning whether Anne Frank had ever really existed. Enraged and determined to prove that Frank and her diary were, in fact, the real deal, Wiesenthal hunted down the Gestapo officer who had arrested her. It took five years and a lucky break. A Dutch policeman who had participated in the raid remembered the Gestapo officer's name. It was something like Silvernagel, he said. But there was no Silvernagel in any of the phone books that Wiesenthal poured over. Finally, Dutch investigators loaned him a wartime Gestapo phone book they had secured. And that's where Wiesenthal found him. Carl Silberbauer, living out in the open as a police officer in Vienna. Afraid of the bad press, the police department quietly suspended him. But a fellow officer leaked the story, and soon, journalists mobbed Silberbauer's home, where he confessed immediately, though he was never formally prosecuted. Some people might have been content to stop at a few high-profile names. Not Wiesenthal. The Nazis tried to rid the world of Jews. Now Wiesenthal tried to rid the world of Nazis. He located the Commandant of Treblinka in Sobibor in Brazil. He showed up at the door of Hermione Braunsteiner Ryan, the supervisor of Majdanek who had murdered hundreds of children and was notorious for kicking prisoners to death with her hobnail jackboots. She had been hiding as a housewife in Queens, New York, terrified the Nazi hunter would find her. But other criminals stayed just out of his reach. For years, Wiesenthal chased Dr. Joseph Mengele, the so-called angel of death, whose grotesque medical experiments made a mockery of the medical profession. Though Wiesenthal claimed to know Mengele's every move, the angel of death drowned in Brazil at the age of 67, cheating the Nazi hunter of the chance to bring him to trial. Still, Wiesenthal helped send over a thousand Nazis to trial in prison. It might sound like superhero work, but in reality, his efforts were painstakingly detailed, analytical, and patient. Piles of letters, testimonies, pictures, and maps littered his desk. He listened to the personal testimony of thousands of victims. People flocked to him with information, including Nazis with grudges against former colleagues. And then he would sit, puzzling together shards of data from multiple sources, connecting seemingly unrelated pieces until he had built a solid case. When he finally had his case, he'd go to the appropriate authorities. And if government sat on their hands, he took matters to the press. Local government soon grew tired of the Nazi hunter. Austria had little interest in rehashing the crimes of the past. Wiesenthal was a sore and frankly annoying reminder of Austria's role in the genocide. And he caused quite a splash in the Israeli Knesset when he insisted on holding a procession through the streets of Tel Aviv, the main focus of which was a glass box filled with ashes collected from the death camps. It was a morbid display, one that reflected the new state's ambivalence over how to deal with the aftermath of genocide. But world governments weren't behind the constant stream of death threats that filled an entire office in Wiesenthal's home. In 1982, a bomb sent by German and Austrian new Nazis blew off the front of his house. But the Nazi hunter was a man obsessed, and he'd already cheated death so many times before. So he kept compiling his research, kept adding to his stamp collection, kept the victim's memories alive. His wife once said that she wasn't married to one man, but to thousands of the dead. It wasn't just ghosts that haunted Wiesenthal. Wherever he went, controversy followed. The head of the Mossad at the time of Eichmann's capture claimed Wiesenthal not only played no role in the operation, but in fact nearly sabotaged it when he spilled secret information. The US Department of Justice was enraged when Wiesenthal leaked confidential information to the press about one of Eichmann's accomplices. Wiesenthal had suggested he found the former Nazi, even though the Office of Special Investigations actually deserved the credit. The Canadian government accused Wiesenthal of majorly exaggerating the number of war criminals residing in Canada, giving them useless lists of names while withholding valuable information. So Wiesenthal's claims that he could track Mengele's every move? Most likely untrue, but a great way to get media attention. Critics question many of Wiesenthal's wartime stories. Remember the story about how he was saved from a shooting lineup? By many accounts, this hadn't happened to Wiesenthal at all, but rather to his friend. After liberation, he spoke about having been in four camps. By the early 1980s, that number had jumped to more than a dozen. Wiesenthal dedicated his life to making sure that no one could forget or deny the Holocaust. 
So there's a painful irony that over time, some of his stories acquired embellishments that undermined their authenticity. And yet, it's this larger-than-life reputation, with all its complexities and controversies, that helped shape our understanding of the Holocaust. Wiesenthal emphasized that Jews were not the Nazis' only victims, demanding the world recognize the Nazis' persecution and murder of Roma, communists, dissidents, and other groups of so-called undesirables. It's in thanks part to Wiesenthal that the Holocaust is acknowledged as a crime against all of humanity and he fought to combat hate and racism wherever they existed. The world may have wanted to sweep the past under the rug, but Wiesenthal would not let anyone forget. Hunting and trying Nazis is one form of justice, but so is remembering. He often reflected on a conversation with another survivor, who suggested that Wiesenthal could have been rich if he had returned to architecture instead of Nazi hunting. But Wiesenthal answered, After our death, we will meet all these people killed by the Nazis. And I will tell them, I didn't forget you.